Uh, so, welcome uh, to Wisdom's Chats. Uh, for the first time in over 200 Wisdom's Chats, we are starting uh, late. Uh, and uh, so, as Trevor says, we, you, you, you think plan A is plan A, but uh, it, you always have to have a plan B. Uh, so, this is plan B, and uh, very happy to all be to, together. And uh, so, I'm going to launch into the topic. Uh, which was reflecting on what do we learn from the past. So Trevor's taken us down this rabbit warren uh, because he has spent the last four weeks of, um, of holiday time uh, investigating and exploring past events. And, uh, and we've been regaled with all kinds of uh, gory stories of millions of people being slaughtered. Uh, and saying, well, nothing's changed. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so what we wanting to, to do today is to say, well, does the past teach us anything? That's the question that we are phrasing for ourselves. And uh, so, so Trevor, you launched the topic, uh, what, what's in your mind and, and share with us what's your thoughts. It just shows you how much ahead of the game we are. Adrian Gore last night uh, put out a little report he was reading from the World Health uh, Organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he was approaching exactly the same subject. And, and it was, uh, was based on having a look at major pa pandemics throughout uh, history, going back to the bubonic plague. Uh, and what transpired from there. And he was asking, what were our opinions? So if you go on to LinkedIn, uh, Adrian Gore, you'll actually find that particular report. I found it quite interesting. Um, but there were headlines and I was about to respond to him. Uh, in fact, I'm just gonna copy uh, the response because he wanted some responses and he, he gave these as, or the World Health Organization gave these as the uh, key topics. I'm just going to put them up here in the chat that they uh, discussed. Uh, let me see. Right there. Um, so the report actually covered these things. And obviously, they have a vested interest, the World Health Organization and Adrian Gore of Discovery. Uh, I think this guy's an absolute local genius. Um, so I think they have a vested interest in the first headline. Um, the second one that they brought up was to expect the unexpected. The third was how an expanded state starts getting involved. And I think that links to uh, the poor suffer the most. Uh, and especially uh, when you go back in history, uh, you see how these pandemics uh, tend to affect the poor in such a big way that there's an inequality gap. And then you can trace back to the French Revolution, what goes on. And as I was saying, I was going back into Persia to see what Genghis Khan was doing and how he annihilated a, a million Persians uh, in his day. Just fascinating stuff about how people react to crisis and, and that, um, for me, what's going on here is that point four, accelerating technologies and economies that after a major pandemic, and, and I would like to put that under the bubble of a major crisis, um, I think the technologies of the day uh, or the days that are just on the cusp of breaking tend to be accelerated forward maybe five, 10 years um, faster than they would have been if there was not a crisis in place. And I think we have got one of the most significant crises uh, to hit our world in historic terms. Uh, and I think that's accelerating all of these technologies that we've got to be very aware of that we thought might only happen over the next three to five years, maybe 10 years. I think they're going to happen very quickly now. So we've got to be on top of that. That's one of my views. Um, and then the, the rider to that is what uh, perhaps we touched on yesterday with Ivan. Uh, the more things change, uh, the less things change. And, and I would put that the more things change, the less we as human beings change. 
Uh, and really what stimulated that thinking is, is the chaos that erupted in Washington state capital over the last week. Uh, when you have a look at what you believe are intelligent people who should be actually going back over history to see what actually happens. And, and my concern is, as I go back to these major events, within five, 10, 15 years, in fact, 10, 15 years, you actually see this rise of autocrats and despots who tend to work with uh, those people that have been ravaged by the crisis, form them into pelotons of armed forces to go out and uh, all that happens is plunder and millions die. Um, and, and so I'm concerned about that. And, and how do we learn from history not to repeat that again? Um, am I going down the direction you wanted me to go, <laughs> Lee? Yeah, no, uh, talk. Sure. Talk. <laughs> Scott, have you help me, Scott. Have you uh, because, I missed uh, you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and let me tell you, I think it is so important uh, that people like ourselves are, are highlighting what it is that we don't learn from history so that we try and influence the way to take this accelerating technology change for the good of humankind. And then, of course, uh, how can I worry about humankind if I haven't looked after myself and my family first? and respect that everyone else in humankind uh, we should respect wants to put themselves first with a roof over their head if they haven't got it. Um, to get to the point of never having to face a pandemic like this again without having the resources to actually survive. Um, but we've got to do that, I believe, from an internal locus out uh, and recognizing if we have that respect for ourselves, we've got to have that respect for everyone else at the same time. Let me shut up. Hey, Trevor, you're on fire. <laughs> Let's do an interview with you, Trevor. I think we should do a, yeah. a pop-up video interview and, uh, and get it out. I think, I think we need to. Um, just, I mean, I, guys, if you wouldn't believe the, the, the last six weeks. Last night, I was up until 3.30 in the morning um, on a Zoom call with 1,000 people um, I don't know if any of you guys were on it or part of it, um, with uh, Dr. William Hill, uh, who is the World Health Organization's consultant uh, in the UK from the University of Liverpool, um, as well as a bunch of other doctors, um, two, three nights ago um, on the, uh, the presentation with uh, Professor Paul Merrick from America and uh, uh, Dr. Pierre Corey, who was uh, in front of the US Senate. Um, I'm in contact with Dr. Tess, um, uh, Dr. Tess, Laurie, who's just put together a full analysis of the meta analysis um, uh, on a, off her own bat, uh, on because I've been I've been getting very very involved in this whole ivermectin thing, guys. There is, and it goes back to what you said, Trevor. There's an effective treatment for COVID, and it's been available since April. And not to try and get involved in the conspiracy stuff because there's no need to go down that road at all. It's pure on the science basis that. We, it's, 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 it's an integral part of our future. Now, Trevor, you mentioned earlier, like how do we get the resources so that if this ever happens again, um, we protect ourselves? What is the list of things we need to have in place for that? Because I, I've lost so much faith. I didn't have much faith in government and medicine in the first place. It's been shattered now after learning what I've learned. And, and if I can respond to that, Scott and Lee, this is actually going to become a bantering backwards and forwards for anyone who, who can break in, I think. Um, but look, I have personal insight to this because uh, I'm connected to people who are sitting down now at oxygen levels below 85 at the moment. My brother-in-law has just come out of, uh, he got down to 88. In fact, one of my water polo captains from 40 years ago is down at 83 right at the moment. I've had people right around me pass away in the last six weeks, which I haven't mentioned here at all because I believe everyone is affected. Uh, but the most interesting comment came uh, from my, uh, well, I better not say who it is in, in case someone wants to go chasing whatever, uh, but they managed to source ivermectin. And from being on death door within 48 hours, now I'm not one, you know, in, in fact, I am 
you know, I blow conspiracy theories out of the water. I'm sick and tired of them. I'm sick and tired of fake news and all that type of nonsense. But this is a genuine story from me uh, that you can absolutely trust. I'm not interested in bulldust. Uh, it pulled this guy off his deathbed in 48 hours. How it did it, I don't know. What it did, I don't know. What it has done is made me very interested in this ivermectin uh, that we've got to get very quickly into the research of this thing. If we can put billions into speeding up the release of, of things that normally take three to five years to actually research their efficacy, why can't it be done for ivermectin, which is approved in, yeah. in what I believe in other countries? Yeah, um, it's over if, the counter. In here in yeah. Indonesia, I've got it. I can, I've got it in front. I've got it here. It's available here. Most people don't know about it here. I like, I'm getting quite emotional when you talk like this, Trevor. I really mm. am, because well, uh, um, I've been in, I've been in, in, in this for the last six weeks, and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's horrendous. Like what this thing is being hidden from us, um, and, and I don't want it obviously to steal the show with the ivermectin thing. It, it's, it's, it's symptomatic of, of, of more solutions that are needed. Um, I am a huge fan, for example, of having local food gardens five or six, seven, eight households getting together and saying one household, create a little garden, we'll chip in a bit of money and we have our own food being created. That's your first step towards sustainability. Getting I'm, your water I'm, right, I'm entrepreneurial been type ventures. I have been there for 10 to 15 years. Trevor, Trevor, thank, thank, I am going to now. <laughs> Love the conversation between the two of you, um, but we would love to hear some other perspectives. Uh, so Scott, we, I'm not sure we've heard enough from you, but we, we may well come back, but uh, we'd love to hear maybe from Edward and Rajesh and Ivan. So, so Edward, um, we, we started off talking about what does the past teach us? That's still the topic, but you're welcome to come at it from whatever angle you like. Yeah. I'll st try and stay on script um, because I'm very compliant. And I, I think it's interesting because you know, what does the past teach us? And I think most of what Trevor said was about observing what the past has done. And to me, teaching is not worth a jot unless you learn something and unless it makes a difference. And I thought instinct, and, and I, I, I'll, I will declare an interest. I am history. I remember my daughters coming home from school and talking about learning in history about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. My younger daughter in history learned about the assassination of Martin Luther King. I was about 14 at the time. I remember it. I remember history. Um, and instinctively, I felt that we never learn from, from history. And then I tried to think of it, some examples. And I couldn't. I couldn't think of any examples of where we not learn from history. I thought, well, that's strange. You know, there, there must be things we've repeated. Then I started doing some research and a lot, of, and, and I hate history. I hated history at school. I don't see the point of it. It's the past. It's done with. It's gone. It's not relevant. So I did a bit of research, and, and everyone's saying, "Well, history teaches us about the human condition." Um, and I thought, okay. And then I came back to my thought about um, we never learn from history. And there's an old Spanish proverb. The second time you get kicked by a donkey, you don't learn anything. And if we assume the first kick is in history and the second kicks in the future, then because there's a saying about it, it must be we never learn from history. And then I thought, and then I thought of two really good examples. One was Hitler invading Russia because he made exactly the same mistake as Napoleon did when he invaded Russia. They both invaded Russia at the, roughly the same time and they expected it to be very quick. And they ended up stuck in a Russian winter and they lost because of the Russian winter. So that was a lesson that Hitler could have quite easily learned. And fortunately he didn't, otherwise I doubt we'd be sitting here. Um, 
The other one is COVID and the 1918 flu epidemic, which was probably the, 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 you know, the first really big pandemic that, that wiped out millions of people all over the world. And if you look at how it developed, it spread throughout the world because people were moving about. And it first appeared in, for, in different countries at the ports. And then you could map its spread along the major travel routes. What's the thing we didn't do when COVID started? Or well, certainly in the UK, we didn't close the airports. It's only just now, when we're right at the top of the second wave, that we've closed, well, haven't we? we haven't closed the airports, we're still allowing people in. They're supposed to self-isolate, they probably don't. So we didn't learn from that. Uh, the biggest lesson we could have learned about the pandemic from the 1918, and we didn't learn it. And I think perhaps it is because, because a friend of mine asked me, why, why are the airports open? Why are we letting people in? And I'm sure it's because of money. And that's the one lesson we never learned, that money corrupts everything. So those are my thoughts. I, I kept them short because we're a bit short of time. So. Well, you know what, Edward, I love the fact that we're not afraid to have an opinion. So <laughs> th thank you. Uh, Rajesh, you are new to our chats. And uh, so I, I, you've hit a topic <laughs> where, where we certainly are sharing uh, thoughts and ideas, which is what Wisdom's Chat is all about. So we'd love to hear, you know, what your thinking is and, and is there something you'd like to add to the conversation? Well, perhaps a little bit more of a perspective rather than add. Um, you know, we, as, as a world, we are in deep trouble, seriously deep trouble. You know, I'm now 60 years old and it's for the first time um, in my years that the entire medical profession globally put up their hands collectively at the same time, all the doctors, and said, we have failed. Please, we are the spiritual leaders of all religious groups. Go to every hospital you can go to set up your mic system and pray. Okay. Uh, for a scientist, we know medical people are scientists, to acknowledge that they failed and there's only God to help is a very serious, very serious act. Now, this brings home the, the level of trouble we're in. Okay. Now, this morning, whether the, um, I got it from a good friend of mine, but whether the source is legitimate and correct, I do not know. But it's really a poster that says, and I tried to copy and paste it on the chat, but I failed. Uh, but it's a very short poster that says that the NHI in America has approved ivermectin for the treatment of COVID. That's what it says, basically. And then there's a challenge to it that says, if it's true and, and that's what's going to happen. You know, we're going to have a lot of red faces at the on the South African regulatory bodies. Okay. Now I have a view about this ivermectin. I'm not going to talk about its merits or demerits, but I would say this: that if it's not able to harm a human being through its consumption in any way, in other words. It's not toxic, it's not gonna harm you. And there's no other option, then take it. I would, I would. And if my loved one is in trouble in hospital, I'd give it to them. Purely because we know that with this, the current strain through the second wave, if you go on a ventilator, the chances of you coming out is highly remote, no matter who you are. We know that. So what have we got to lose? However, 
we must recognize that we have laws in our country. And I am perhaps more partial to attacking the regulators and government to approve it first, and even if that means a stand-up fight, approve it and you know get the damn thing rolling because it's easily available, it's easily made, it's cheap. And my only precondition is even if it doesn't work, let it not harm the person any more than they are sick. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Rajesh. Wise words, uh, and really appreciate you you sharing. I think it's uh, it gives us a, as I say, a word of wisdom. Ivan, how do you want to sweep the whole thing up and uh, share, share your insights? I think it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, way to go. The, you know, this morning. Uh, the fundamental question is, do we learn from the past? And as as Ed, Ed said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that we ever do, you know, so the question is, what is driving behavior? Um, so if we're not learning from the past and we're not learning from from, you know, history and we're not learning from these sorts of things, what is driving what is driving human behavior in general? I'm, I'm not going to talk about the pandemic or ivermectin or anything like that. I think, you know, that, that's a topic that could keep us going and, uh, you know, for, for hours and hours. But uh, so the, the question is, again, simply that, you know, what do we need to do to start learning from the past? Can we learn from the past? And if we can, how do we actually encourage that process? So, you know, for me, it, become, it comes back down to a mindset, you know, I think really at the end of the day, what is driving all these things, we, you know, everybody else has been talking about this morning. For me, that's quite a, quite a simple question to answer. It's vested interest. It's simply vested interest. Um, there's a vested interest in not providing one thing and there's a vested interest in providing something else. Why? Probably because farms are being greased and back pockets are being filled. You know, and brown paper bags have been handed around around the place. So whether that's conspiracy theory or not, I, I, I don't, don't believe it is. I think it's the way governments operate. Um, you know, and especially in this country, um, but I don't think it's any different in any other country. We've had this discussion in one of our other wisdoms chats about about the UK government and and uh, the levels of corruption and and things that are there. You know, you just have to glance at what's happened in America over the last four or five months from a political perspective and you can just see the rubbish and the nonsense that's going on there and it's all about it's all about that vested interest and the, and the vested interest of the people who are actually um, running the show so for me the, the real question is as a voter have we learned anything do we learn anything we vote these people into power and then we sit back and and we accept the nonsense that they that they putting forth and, uh, um, you know, do we, like Rajesh says, do we actually stand up and fight, you know, uh, or do we just say, well, you know, they're in power for the next four or five years or whatever the cycle happens to be in your country. Uh, there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, are we holding these people accountable for the decisions and the actions that they, that they're taking? Um, and, and again, we just have to look at, at another simple example here, and we, and we discussed the merits and the demerits of it the other day in one of our sessions, you know, this alcohol ban in, in this country. Um, now, you might not like alcohol, you might not believe alcohol is a good thing, um, but guess what? You are wiping out the livelihoods of millions of people. You're actually destroying a whole sector of the population, the economy, on the off chance of possibly saving a few hospital beds. For, for for trauma from from trauma patients for for COVID patients, um, does that justify destroying people's livelihoods? No, I'm not sure that it does. You know whether you as I say whether you like whether you like alcohol or not is 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 in my mind immaterial. It could be any industry, and, and it has been other industries. You know I mean all our businesses except for absolutely essential services were shut down for months in this country at the start of this pandemic. Um, and that destroyed livelihood, lost jobs. I mean, the lost jobs around the world uh, are going to far exceed the lost lives, I believe. Um, and, and yeah, so what are we learning? 
yeah, I have to agree with that. I'm not sure that we learn anything particularly. And the only way I see that changing is, is to really get a complete mindset shift and, and get people to stand up and start, uh, you know, start, start actually holding, holding other people accountable for these repetitive, stupid decisions that are being made uh, without looking um, at, a, at history and B, at the available knowledge and, and material that's that's there to enable us to take better decisions. Uh, so, yeah, that's my generalized uh, thoughts on 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 a on a hot topic. Thank, thanks, thanks, Ivan. I, um, as I say, it's a good thing we we uh, aren't afraid to share our opinions on this platform. Um, and yeah, I mean, who knew that uh, we would we would feel so strongly about what we are not learning about the past. Um, and uh, so I, I also did just, uh, and I know we're running over time a little bit, normally we would only be 30, 40 minutes and it would, uh, so if we just take two more minutes, um, just to say that I was determined in my research to find something that we had learned from the past. Uh, so that I could share some good news and come from a positive perspective. And uh, so the best I could find was a series of uh, charts and, and infographics from Box uh, that it, it demonstrates how even over the last 30 to 40 years, the condition, of, the human condition has improved from uh, poverty levels to child mortality to access to malaria nets uh, to uh, you know there's a, a whole range of things where the, the the curve is of is going down or up uh, it depending on in, in terms of increase of the the livelihoods and the the health and the well-being uh, of, of humanity. So something is changing. Something is changing about the quality of our lives. What, when you get into specifics though, so when I, I was looking, okay, so, so what have we learned from past pandemics? So the Spanish flu and, the, and, and COVID, there was just one line that just really struck me, is that one of the reasons that they they say the Spanish flu spread as much as it did as they didn't get the information as quickly as they, they could because it took so long for messages to get across oceans. Um, and the same thing happened is nation states, governments were slow to act despite the fact that information was really readily and speedily available. So unfortunately, I came back to the same point is we've learned nothing from history. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I the, the conversation, you know, Rajesh, Ivan, Trevor, Scott, everybody actually touched on it and, and it was something that I raised yesterday as well. And the, the, the phrase, the question I'm gonna pose for us for tomorrow is, what is our responsibility and power as the consumer or the voter? Who are we, this little person in the middle of these vested interests, whether it's industry, big business, government, what is our power, what is our responsibility? And, and, uh, so, and so basically, what are we going to do about it? Uh, so that's that's the question I'd like us to to think about for tomorrow. We'd love to see you all there, and uh, hopefully we'll get the right link at the right time. Trevor, right, that, that's what I wanted to ask. We're going to go back to the wisdoms chats link. Uh, Ivan, do you think it was a, a problem from your side, or was it the Zoom side on our link? Um, Trevor, I'm not, I'm not under sure. I definitely had a fiber a fiber connectivity problem this morning, so. Uh, my fiber went down at four minutes to eight as I was trying to set up the session, um, and and only came back when I when I got back online now. So whether my inability to connect to Zoom was simply a symptom of that, uh, very likely. 
although Lee did say she battled to to log into to my ID as well. Um, but that you know that, that, that that's so uh, I'm I'm hoping it was just simply a connectivity problem on my side. So we'll be back on the standard wisdoms chats link uh, tomorrow morning. Failing all else, uh, yeah, um, we will get a message out on the WhatsApp groups again, and perhaps we need to set up a WhatsApp group specifically for wisdoms chats as well. I don't know. So Lee, um, I'm going to give. You